Over the past few years, tragically few people have paid any real attention to what's going on uh, in the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. And uh, since then, even many of those people have apparently forgotten about how bad that situation was and is. And so I have all the respect in the world for people who do the work of trying to get people to understand the human tragedy that is playing out there. And uh, one of those people I'm very glad to say is joining us on the show right now, Director Sky Fitzgerald, Director of the Oscar-nominated Lifeboat. Uh, Sky, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, very glad to have you here. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed Lifeboat. Uh, obviously, it's a it's a very it's a dark, somber um, uh, tragedy that plays out there. But uh, I did a great job of making clear what is really going on. And so I wanted to ask you about uh, why you engaged in this project uh, and and what the the nature of it is. Who are you following? The the people in the organization. Yeah. So so. As you probably know, John, you know, we're currently experiencing sort of the greatest humanitarian crisis of a generation um, with the number of refugees um, who who are in refugee camps right now, fleeing both uh, wars in the Middle East as well as displacement due to climate change. So what we did is we felt it was really critical to try to shine a light on this as much as possible. So we're doing a trilogy of films called the Refugee Trilogy. Lifeboat um, is the second in that trilogy, which we filmed embedded with a small Berlin-based NGO called Sea Watch that conducted uh, a search and rescue operation off the coast of Libya. And so what I find amazing about it is that you're, uh, the audience is seeing B-roll right there. Um, I, I talked about uh, that crisis quite a bit on, on our shows at the time, and, and I thought that I knew a lot about it. But, but seeing the footage again is such a reminder that when you hear about like that these people are crossing on boats, it's like a loose use of that term. Like these are these are not capable of making that crossing, and so many people are on them. And so while you're showcasing individual stories, there's also these insane numbers that one in every 18 people who crossed drowned is listed in the movie. Uh, literally thousands have died. Um, and and during the time of the documentary, you that the organization rescues literally thousands of people. And so can you talk a little bit about? Uh, the the danger, the danger both of the crossing when these people attempt to cross over to Europe, but also the conditions that have led them to be willing to make that extremely dangerous crossing. Yeah, so so the numbers when we filmed uh, were that um, about one in eighteen people who attempt this crossing perish in the attempt, and. Sadly and, and horrifyingly, they go into it knowingly, knowing that those risks were very high. And they make that choice anyway. And they make it because what they're leaving behind is so much worse. Um, you know, we interviewed many, many asylum seekers during the course of, of filming Lifeboat. And if there was one narrative that emerged over and over again, it was that. Um, People were trafficked as soon as they crossed the border into Libya because it's a fractured nation state. And after they were trafficked, uh, the women were repeatedly raped. Uh, the men um, were often turned into uh, slaves, modern day slaves, and forced to work in rock quarries, often just breaking rock with sledge sledgehammers for no pay. And it was only after they were able to secure funds from family members uh, from their country of origin, that they even had an opportunity to to leave this modern form of slavery and take this risk to get on the raft, which wasn't seaworthy, to try to cross the channel. So um, even though the risks were great, the rafts were often not seaworthy at all. All of them echoed this sentiment that that was better than staying where they were um, and risking um, multiple rapes, risking being a modern day slave. So the conditions were horrific um, and they haven't gotten any better since we filmed, sadly. And can you talk to us about uh, both Sea-Watch and also John Castle, uh, the captain of uh, one of the boats in, in the film? Um, th this organization, what sorts of resources do they have? I mean, obviously they're up against a titanic struggle to help these people. Um, what, what, what do they have access to? How, how is that going? So Sea-Watch is, is this you know, German-based NGO made up completely of volunteers. And, and that's one of the inspiring parts of this to me personally as a filmmaker. When I learned that you know, there were thousands of, of asylum seekers drowning in the Mediterranean because the EU nation states hadn't intervened quickly or properly to save those in distress, um, and that there was this very small NGO who had heard about this and of their own accord decided that um, 
you know, as a civil society entity, they could intervene and save people's lives. So Sea-Watch is this very small NGO based in Berlin that saw this problem um, as humanitarians decided we can do something about this, purchased um, a retrofitted research vessel, 30 meters long, and put together an all-volunteer crew to motor down off the coast of Libya and start saving lives. And they did it because they felt like it was the right thing to do. And they continue to try to do it despite very stiff and difficult political right-wing rhetoric throughout Europe. Um, So it was a challenge then. It's even more of a challenge now. Um, John Castle, the captain of the vessel, uh, was an amazing individual. He spent most of his adult life volunteering um, with organizations like Sea Watch, he also was the f- original captain of the Rainbow Warrior Greenpeace's anti-whaling vessel, and he would work on commercial captain jobs only long enough to save enough money so he could go out and volunteer on- with organizations like this again. So he was deeply inspiring to us during the course of filming, and I think to everyone around him. So uh, as uh, as I was watching the the film and and seeing you have a, a number of different individuals profiled from a number of different countries, um, you learn more about their stories and you know missing siblings and um, the, the the torture and rape and all of that. And so I'm curious. Obviously, there's an educational component to this that people will learn more about this this life that they have never themselves lived. Um, based on your interviews, what other like misconceptions about the migrant experience and and what these people go through would you want people to to, to better understand after seeing this this film. Well, you know, the, as you know, John, there's a lot of right wing rhetoric that you know these these um, these economic migrants is the term that's tossed around a lot are simply you know coming to Europe or coming to the U S. right to take someone's job, and you know that's that's simply not true if you if you look at the numbers and and if you interview people as well, um, the people that we talked with and met with, as I noted, um, they, they came from a, a vast spectrum of experience before they entered Libya. Some were fleeing the war in, in Syria, and they had been able to make it to Cairo and then work their way overland before departing from the beaches. They were simply fleeing war. There were others who were fleeing um, conscription um, in Somalia and other countries in East Africa. Um, there were others who had been trafficked and were, were fleeing from their captors, basically. And then there were a small, smaller number of, of you know, people who had chosen to leave a life where they were trying to raise a family of two to six children, right, on a dollar and a half a day. And they decided that it was a better choice for them to try to give their children food every day than to stay where they were. So if you want to term that economic migrants, great. But there are people who are simply trying to survive, who are trying to make a better life for themselves. Yeah, and, and thankfully projects like yours can can help people to see that, uh, although they're going through tragedies that, that thankfully few people in America ever have to experience, that these are very similar in terms of their motivations and, and where they're coming from and what they, they hope to, to end up with in terms of their life situation. Um, so Sky, thank you so much for joining us and for the project and congratulations on the Oscar nomination for Lifeboat. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.